you guys who helped out with the uh, youth day last week, it was just such such a blessing. I mean, you guys did just such a great job. Um, I don't know who all helped, but I, I know that Ricky was out there with John, and I think uh, Major was out there too, and mm -hmm. everybody was out there setting up. They did a great job, and then, you know, I, uh, I was in there with, uh, with uh, Chuck in the youth building, and uh, I came out, and all the stuff was torn down. I was like, hey, man, that's all right. <laughs> And uh, everybody just did a great job. Um, I know Diana and Gracie were making popcorn, and there were all kinds of people doing stuff, and just such a great job, guys. So, uh, anyways, well, we're gonna be looking at religion versus God. And uh, you know, oftentimes when we think of religion, we think of God. But oftentimes, religion is kind of, uh, it kind of contrasts with God. And uh, to be funny, I named part one, Don't Be Naked, and you'll see why. In just a minute, okay? It's, it's nothing weird, I promise. Um, you, you know, I grew up in, in kind of a legalistic background where if you were, I mean, if you were a really righteous person, you would be dressed, I mean, you would be decked out and duded out. I mean, you had to have ties on and all kinds of stuff. And, uh, you know, it wasn't real long in ministry before I realized that the only people who were impressed with how nice I looked were the people who, were, who grew up in church their whole life. It didn't mean a whole lot to the druggies. Nope. Didn't mean a whole lot to uh, the people who we were actually trying to witness to. It was a country club thing. You, you looked the part of the golf club so your membership was valid. You know, whether the, if, if you wore anything that deviated from that, it's almost like you were a heretic. Because, you know, women can't wear pants and... I mean, all, oh boy, there was a whole list of boy. Don't get me started. It was, uh, it was very um, odd. Now, you know, obviously, if you want to dress up, whatever, that's your own thing. But when you start impressing things on other people without a biblical basis, probably not the greatest thing. So, you know, one thing about legalism is legalistic people like to look how they feel better than everybody else. See, the thing about legalism is, is it convinces us that we're better than other people. That somehow we're more favored by God, especially because of all the things that we do. Look at what I've done, God. That means that you have to, you have to answer all my prayers and you have to treat me with respect, God, because I mark all the, I check all the boxes. But if you notice... Chuck and, and Randy and I, we make sure that we dress like people in the community dress. And there's a reason for that. Because we're not better than them. And we want them to think that they belong here. Because they do belong here. We're here to see people saved. We're not here to do the same routine every single week for nothing. So, I mean, we, we don't go through all the motions so that we can say, hey, we went through the motions. We love people. And then they come to God, and then we teach them to love people so that other people come to God. You know, it's a process. We love people. That's the, that's the process. And I want to hopefully get you to think a little bit tonight about how to love people more. And uh, for a lot of people, images like this might not be so foreign. You know, you've got everything. The building's just, I mean, look at that building. It's just, Wow. This guy's all decked out. He's got a hat on in church. Somebody didn't tell him that that's a no-no. <laughs> you know, I can't figure it out. If In some churches, if you wear a hat, you get yelled at. In other churches, if you don't wear a hat, you get yelled at. I, I can't figure it out. It, it's one of those things where people just like to make up rules and then like to enforce it for other people. And, and it's whatever. But, you, you know, look at him. Look how, look how dude, it, dude it out he is. If you notice, I'm not wearing my robes today. Because I don't have any robes. <laughs> Um, but some of the dress rules that I thought were, were kind of funny, I already mentioned that women couldn't wear pants. Um, no hats in church, I already mentioned that. Um, no, no long hair for men. There was, a, oh man, there's a big, big thing about it. I mean, if you had hair past a certain length, I mean, it didn't even have to be long. I mean, past any real length. You know, you had basically a mob out to stone you. Um, women couldn't have too short of hair. I think they actually had a, some, some churches had a rule of, of how close to the color it could be. Um, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. And, and I understand the whole idea of modesty, but there's a line between modesty and country club. You know what I mean? If, 
if people aren't even welcome in your building because, <laughs> because they have to address a certain way so as to comfort your own ego, I'm pretty sure that God's not being honored in that situation. And, uh, you know, but then on the other hand, I went to this one church, you guys will get a kick out of this, and this teenage girl came in and she was wearing like this, um, it was like a trench coat, you know, it's a cover. And uh, she's all sitting there, we're in, our, we're in our Sunday school, you know, churches used to do Sunday school. Uh, it was like a church before church, basically the idea of it. And uh, so she was covered up in this, in this, um, in this, you know, this big coat. And out of nowhere, she flips that thing open, and she's wearing lingerie to church. And it is the most awkward thing in the world. To add to the awkwardness, the Sunday school teacher is the pastor's wife. So she does this. All the all the boys in in there don't know where to look. Because, like, we don't want to, you know, um, and so then, then the pastor's wife does this number. And I'm not joking. You can't make this stuff up. I mean, it was the most awkward thing I've ever experienced in my life. And uh, so there obviously is a balance, you know. First Timothy 2, 9 through 10 says about how you don't need to try and get people, um, you know, to turn their heads at you. You know, do dress modestly. But there's a line between, once again, dressing modestly and trying to, um, impress everybody. And once again, not everyone who dresses up is fake or anything. I'm not trying to say that. But I've found that a lot of fake people like to dress in such a way where people have to look up to them. In Colossians 3, 12 through 14, that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. And, you know, I was very surprised with how much people talk about what you ought to or not not to wear in church. I was so surprised of how little is said in the Bible about what you should wear to church. That blew my mind. In the Old Testament, do you know what they wore to, wore to go give sacrifices? Whatever they had on. Regular clothes. You know what the priests had to wear was they had to wear these certain things with hats. Imagine that. They were allowed in, in the Holy of Holy Place with a hat on their head and they weren't killed by God. But then, in the time after Jesus came, nothing. We don't see anybody talking about what you should and shouldn't wear, except Paul briefly says, basically, dress modestly. Well, that's kind of a, a vague thing. But for how much people talk about how you ought to dress in church, I was kind of expecting a big, long thing in the Bible. Read the whole thing. It's not there. So we get to Colossians 3, 12 uh, through 14. Let's read it through. It says, So as those who have been chosen uh, of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Now, the word here in verse 12, I don't want to get too into this, but it, when it says put on, it, the idea here is clothes. Basically, get dressed in. So you can say it like this. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, get dressed in a heart of compassion. Kindness. This is the only part in the New Testament where it says what you should wear to church. And it blows my mind that none of these things are actual clothing articles. It's good character. All of these things are good character. Not a single one of these things is an article of clothing. That blows my mind. So then I started doing some research. And do you know what the New Testament church wore to their gatherings? Their everyday clothes. The whole idea of dressing up for a service was completely unfounded until after 300 AD, after the church had already existed for 300 years. And the reason behind it was Constantine made the church a thing of the empire instead of a thing about serving God. And along with those boundaries, you had to dress the part. You had to dress the part. So it was basically uh, a thing to make themselves look better because the emperor looked sharp, and so they all wanted you know, each other to pat each other on the back. So then, as the church became more and more imperialized, people tried more and more to impress because that's what the idea of an empire was. And so then you get all the way to the Reformation and things are just so far down the crap, the crap shoot that it's like, wow, where did we end up? And so now we got today where people think that it's a sin to dress in your normal clothes to go to church. Where did we get so far off that not even the Old Testament law had restrictions on clothing? Yet we have made restrictions on other people. Now, I want you to think about this real, real, real careful. Dressing restrictions are fine if you're already a member of the club. <coughs> have you ever been to a club that you've never been to before and they had dress regulations? 
You felt real awkward now replaced, didn't you? And you had to dress up in their nice, fancy clothes before you weren't allowed to attend turn the door if you were ever into a black tie event. That shouldn't be what the church is known for. I mean, just think about this. If we want to get people off the street, if we want to get people who are not saved, if we want to reach the unreached, how does it make sense to expect them to dress in nicer clothes than they even own? And how does that make sense to dress nicer than them? So that when they come in, they feel stupid, they feel poor. I mean, how does that show God's love? See, but a law has been instituted where it actually attacks God. Because God told us to watch out for the weak, for the oppressed, the poor. And now we're doing the exact opposite. And so this is a time when religion is literally attacking God. Religion versus God. And so let's go through a few of the things. The first thing is compassion. Okay, that would be like hurting for others. Okay, so when you see someone in pain, caring. Uh, a good example of this was when Jesus looked out and he saw the multitude. He wasn't bothered by them. Uh, they weren't in his way. Um, you know, even the Pharisees, he did not consider them as people who were in his way. He answered their questions. He never got tired. He never, well, I don't know if he got tired of it, but he never, you know, just ran away and I'm leaving going to my room. You know, you, you see him out there on the streets actually touching people, even people who were his enemies. God, I want to be like you, God, where you just, you're loving people who don't love you. Does, is that really, think about it, is that you? Because I, I, know, I know me. And when, when people are kind of a jerk, I kind of think, well, that ship has sailed. You need to move on. I don't know what friendship you think we could have, but it's not there. Go on. But here we have Jesus being hassled by these guys. They're following him around, nitpicking everything. Or how about the, the world's uh, hardest, the hardest pastor, Moses? He had to live with, live with this congregation for 40 years. You know, a lot of pastors don't like living in, in, uh, on the church property because they, they're already, always bothered by people. Moses couldn't get away. He was stuck there with them. Man, oh man, for 40 years in the desert, I bet you it got hot out there, guys. Woo! So here we have compassion, hurting for people. Next up on the list, it says there, so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness. Kindness is the second one. Kindness shows itself when there are unkind people. I think I'm a kind person. Well, to people who like you. What happens when somebody who doesn't like you comes by? Well, I let them know what's for. Well, is that being kind? See, kindness shows itself in the presence of unkind people. That's how you know if you are a kind people. If a person is, how do you treat the unkind people? So then the third thing on the list is humility. Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So humility. Now, there's a little bit of confusion on what pride is. Humility is not being self-effacing. Self-effacing is basically this. I'm such a worm. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I guess I should go eat worms. That's, that's not humility. Humility is considering others as more important than yourself. Humility is putting others before you. Humility is seeking God's will before your will. That's humility. You get the difference? See, we've, we've been taught that to be humble, you know, we have to go through this long, what's it called? Pony show? Is that what it's called? Uh, dog and pony show. What? Dog and pony show. Ta dog and pony show. Yes, exactly. We've been told we have to go through all this big, long, complicated thing. Humility is more of a thing of the heart, a position of the heart, than it is, you know, trying to impress people because that takes us back to pride. So the next thing in that list in verse 13 was gentleness. Now, I was reading this book. If you know me, I love to read. Um, it, his name was uh, Jim Cimbala. That was the name. Jim Cimbala. He's a pastor in New York, I think, or somewhere like that. Anyways, and uh, so he's pastoring this church, and these people call me and say, hey, we're thinking about selling our house and moving over there and join with you in your ministry. I would think about that. He's like, okay. So then the next week, he, they call again and say, hey, we're doing it. He's like, uh, you're, you're what? He's like, yeah, we're heading out there now. He's like, oh, okay. So they come out. They drive all the way across the U.S., show up at his door, and they're like, okay, this is what we're doing. He's like, okay, well, you can stay in my house, I guess. I mean, you really didn't give us any choice or warning, but okay. <laughs> so that's, I guess, what we're doing now. And uh, so everything seems to be going fine. 
Except behind the pastor's back, they go and they start stirring up the congregation against them, saying about how they could do, do the job better, saying about how he's not caring for the flock, about how he's not doing a good job, saying all these mean, cutting things behind his back. And, uh, wow, that's got to be a kick in the face. But long story short, he goes to him and says, what's the deal? One of my congregation came to me and said that, that, that you're, you're causing, turning our church against us. What, what's going on? And they, and they look at each other and they said, we should go ahead and tell him. And he says, don't hold out on me now. Tell me what. And they say, you're done here, Jim. We're taking over. And for five hours, they droned on and on and on, tearing him down, until finally he just said, you can leave or I can call the cops. And for five hours, I mean, goodness sakes. You know, I don't have the patience to be a pastor. I tell you what, if somebody did that, I'd just be like, no, just get out. I don't care what you have to say, get out. And, uh, but this guy, man, patient, patient, patient. First off, when they showed up at my door, I would have said, you need to go somewhere else. Like, no. But anyways, anyways, so for five hours, until finally he says that, and then they start switching gears, and they say, okay, we're sorry. And they start crying and boo-hooing, well, we're sorry, just let us stay. And he's like, you guys are crazy. You guys are whack jobs. You need to leave, like right now. And so long story short, they end up going, and uh, they had nowhere to go. They had nowhere to go because they sold their house, so they just left. Yeah, it was a, it was a bad situation. But my point being this. Why didn't he just do whatever he could have to end the situation as quickly as possible? See, I think kind of like military terms. I think of, you know, like General MacArthur and stuff. Or how can you end the conflict as soon as possible and win, and win the fight? But in ministry, it's not really like that. And so why didn't he do that? Because it's not about the destination. It's not about the results. It's about the journey. And that goes as a, as a minister and as a leadership minister, too. It's about being gentle. And I'm not talking about indecisive. I'm talking about gentleness. Because this is what God does when we oppose him. He's gentle with us. He's patient with us. And even though he has the right, the right to bring judgment on us, he doesn't. And the next thing on the list, patience. This is giving our time. Suffering for their sake when somebody else is wrong and you're suffering for their sake, not rushing for revenge, just choosing to. It's all right. Patience. The next thing he says. Excuse me. In verse 13. So we'll read verse 12 now that we've gone through that. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Verse 13, bearing with one another. And then the next part there, and forgiving each other. And these things kind of go hand in hand. Uh, we've all been, oh boy, we've all been hurt by family, we've all been hurt by churches, we've all been to places where bad things happen. I mean, that's happened to all of us. If you're in church for long enough, eventually somebody's going to hurt your feelings. It's going to happen. Uh, how do I know that? Because there's people in church, and uh, people make mistakes. And so anywhere that you go, you're going to find people who make mistakes. So I know for a fact, eventually, if you're in church long enough, you will be hurt. But I know that there is a way past the, past the hurt, and I know outlast the problem. Outlast the problem. Forgive them. Do whatever you can. Matthew 18 talks about this quite, quite a bit. Anyways, um, so, you know, we've all been hurt, but forgive, forgive in the same way that God forgave you completely and undeserved. See, God forgave you when it wasn't deserved. So then go and forgive others, even if it's not deserved. See what I mean? Forgive in that same way and bearing. It's, when you think of bearing, when I think of bearing, I think of the World War II pictures where you see, you know, this guy... Carrying this other guy out of, out of the battlefield with you know, blood trickling everywhere. He's wounded. He can't make it out of there. Maybe he stepped on a mine or something. But it, it, his partner's just carrying him out. That's what I think of. Bearing with one, one another. Not, oh, I'm tired of you, so I'm giving up on you. Bearing with one another. Don't just throw in the towel with one another. We're, we're of the same body. And then the next thing on the list, and I think this is the last thing too, 
Um, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love. In verse 14. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Now, some people think that love is a feeling. You know, like, oh, I love her. I love her so much. Well, why do you think that you love her? Because my gut does this thing with the butterflies. Well, that's not love. That's, that's feelings. You, you have feelings for someone. Okay, all right. But feelings come and go. Ask anybody who's been married longer than five years. I mean, feelings come and go. Sometimes you wake up and you're like, Dad, why did I marry you? You know, and then other times you're like, man, you're the greatest spouse in the world. You know, it, 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 it's, it's marriage. You know what I mean? Love has absolutely nothing to do with feelings. And I can guarantee you those people who have made it in the long haul with their marriage, you know, 40, 50, 60 years, they'll always, they'll always say there were times we didn't like each other. <laughs> Because that's what love is. See, we need to get rid of that pipe dream idea of love. Well, you know, I just, I'm not feeling it. You know, I, I, I do not love the pastor. I just don't feel it. Who said you had to feel anything? Love is shown in action. Love is when you lay your life down for the sake of someone else. That's love. Love is when you go out of your way for the sake of others. In 2013, I was lying on a couch, dying. And my wife was there. And she cared for me. And when I was in the hospital, she was there for me every day after work. She went into work, came back and cared for me, went in for work. That's love. She wasn't getting anything out of it. Nothing. That's love. Love isn't I will do for you until I don't get anything back. Love is I will do for you. That's love. And that's why he says here, beyond all these things put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Because no matter how you feel, love will keep us together. So obviously how we dress to service doesn't really matter. Although we should be modest all the time. I, I never really caught that whole, be modest in church. You should be modest all the time. I mean, I'm not going to go out of here and put a thong on and go down, running down the road. I mean, I'm not going to do that. That's disgusting. I'm going to be modest at all times. You know what I mean? It's not a thing about this building. It's a thing about you should be a modest person. See what I mean? So with that being said, you know, how we dress the service, it really doesn't matter. But I will say this. It's not about coming to church dressed right. It's about don't live life naked. Don't live life without compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, without bearing and forgiving others, without loving. Don't live life without those things. That's, that's naked. You want to know how God wants you to dress up for church? The same way he wants you to dress up in, in, in life and in, and in your world and in your family and in your work with gentleness, with patience, with love. That's how God wants you to dress up. So don't come to church naked, which would be with hatefulness, anger, gossip. You know, when I when I, I grew up in a legalistic church, and the biggest thing that they always talked about was homosexuality. That was the that was the icing on the cake. They never any other sin fell short of that sin. But then, as I grew older, I realized, do you know how many churches I've known that were destroyed by homosexuals? None. Do you know how many I've known that were destroyed by gossips? Let me tell you something. Gossip. Destroys you from the inside out. I'm, I'm not saying sexual sins, you know, yes. But gossip tears you out from the inside out. And then it, it infects other people too. It's like a zombie virus. It gets into the air and it pollutes it. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it, it wrecks churches. You see pastors quitting their jobs because their congregation is gossiping. And then they get caught in gossip. And so then they talk bad again against the congregation. Gossip, nobody wins. Nobody wins. If you don't have anything nice to say, just don't say anything at all. So don't, don't come to church with hatefulness, anger, gossip, greed, lust, and strife. Don't go to life with those things. Go to life dressed with compassion, with love. So next week we're going to um, be continuing with religion versus God part two. It will not be about how you should dress. And I promise I won't mention anything else about thoughts. Um, so on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, we have our uh, Going Deeper class. Uh, pastor is talking about discerning of spirits. If you don't know what that is, 
great, come, and you'll learn what that is. Um, and next Sunday morning, uh, Chuck will be talking about um, uh, the purpose of pain, and obviously next Sunday night I already mentioned about how we're going to be continuing the um, series of Religion vs. God. Um, Pastor, can I have you close in, uh, in prayer? And when he's done, Joe, wherever you are, would you mind praying for the 